In this video, I'll teach you exactly how to run a stack of performance enhancing drugs so you can pass as the ultimate fake natty influencer with perfect blood work to match. That's it. There's nothing more to it. Enjoy the three second disclaimer. Vigorous Steve here. Well, you guys asked for it. So here it is the ultimate performance enhancing drug stack making you look like a borderline steroid user, allowing you to get on all the natty or not YouTube reaction channels, which is great for exposure but probably not so good for your mental health. But hey, at least your blood work will be absolutely perfect, allowing you to still claim natural, even though you're f***ing not. And don't get me wrong, you won't be able to pass a drug test. I mean, nobody does drug tests nowadays anyway. Nobody out there, none of the fake natty influencers freely walks into a wide accredited lab and asks for doping tests. And then a couple of weeks later, they post the results with their full legal name and the reference number so we can verify that with the results on their Instagram or YouTube channel. And they don't do that. So I'll show you exactly how easy it is to be enhanced to the gills and not have a trace amount of that show up in your blood work results. And before we get started, we do know based on scientific evidence that oral steroids like Anavar, Halotestin, Proviron, and some others are able to sustain hypothalamic pituitary testis axis functioning and keep luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone levels somewhat in range. But all of the scientific evidence shows that total testosterone levels and especially free testosterone levels and SHBG levels skew to a certain extent. So again, keep in mind that in this video, we're not going to discuss oral steroids or selective androgen receptor modulators because the negative effects that they have on your blood work parameters might be unmanageable. And then an experienced guy like myself or Derek more plates, more dates, certainly will be able to interpret your blood work results and see, Hey, his HDL is too low. His SHBG is too low. His liver enzymes are too high, right? We're trying to prevent this from happening. And I'm probably shooting myself in the foot here, empowering all those fake natty influencers. But hey, content is content, and I'm sure this will get a lot of views. So let's get started with the basics. You could use either pregnenolone, DHEA, or sublingual testosterone. And if you're otherwise natural with normal functioning HPTA, I don't think that pregnenolone or DHEA, sorry, are required. So you can go with sublingual testosterone instead. One to two milligrams around seven o'clock in the evening, which is generally speaking where testosterone levels are the lowest throughout the day. They're the highest at the night and upon waking and then slowly but steadily start to decline during the day so if you take your sublingual testosterone one to two milligrams before your workout scheduling that around seven o'clock in the evening then the peak of serum testosterone levels should not exceed the peak that you have at midnight and upon waking and thus there's no negative effect on your hypothalamic pituitary testis axis and luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone levels will still stay intact. Now, unfortunately, sublingual testosterone metabolizes quite rapidly over the next couple of hours following administration into estradiol and dihydrotestosterone. And even at low dosages of one to two milligrams sublingual testosterone, I don't expect any HPTA downregulation. But if you want to push boundaries, let's say five milligrams sublingual testosterone every day of the week around seven o'clock in the evening, then the increased aromatization into estradiol might downregulate the HPTA. So again, if you want to up the dose slightly and have HPTA intact, then you might need to look into an aromatized inhibitor like aromacin, for example, at 0.3125 milligrams uh, two times or three times per week. So that's an eighth of a 25 milligram tablet. Now, aromacin might have a slight negative effect on your lipids, but if the dose is low enough, it should prevent the aromatization of testosterone into estradiol and keep levels, you know, favorable within the reference range, allowing you to pass as a fake natty. Um, but it shouldn't negatively affect your HDL, LDL, or total cholesterol levels, which is in contrast to Proviron, which might add anabolic load, even though I feel that Proviron is a poor anabolic agent. It might um, prevent the conversion of testosterone into estradiol at very low dosages, let's say um, 6.25 milligrams daily but that has more of a pronounced negative effect on your lipid. So in this context, if you want to push boundaries, five milligrams sublingual testosterone, a very low dose of aromacin goes a very long way. So let's say in this context, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone are still in range. Estradiol is managed, but HDL slightly decreases on your blood work parameters and it's getting closer and closer and closer to 50 milligrams per deciliter or lower, right? That's what the fish oil and the citrus bergamot and the berberine is four. And even if you supplement with 10 milligrams carterine, which shows in clinical evidence, right, human clinical trials and other human studies that it can actually raise 
HDL levels, then you might be able to circumvent this reduction in HDL if you start stacking sublingual testosterone with aromacin, right? There's a multiple of different ways out there for you to control your lipid parameters. And I feel that 10 milligrams cardarine per day should potentiate a good amount of fat loss. I feel that the non-cancerous dose of cardarine is able to raise HDL levels, assuming that there's no significant amount of exogenous anabolic androgenic steroids or selective androgen receptor modulators in place. And right, you can always increase your HDL further by increasing your dietary fat intake. Maybe you have to go with a ketogenic diet, which is also very favorable to look lean and um, somewhat large and in charge on Instagram. And of course, daily fasted cardio will help with that as well. You can also look into enclomiphene monotherapy alongside your sublingual testosterone and perhaps aromacin, right? We're talking about low and effective dosages dosages so low that they will still potentiate a little bit of anabolism and make you look cosmetically appealing to the point everybody thinks you're a fake natty looking better than everybody else that's truly natty, uh, but not to the point that your blood work parameters are significantly skewed. So there will be 6.25 milligrams up to 12.5 milligrams in clomiphene per day, preferably before bed after you've already taken your sublingual testosterone pre-workouts. And it also means that at higher doses of enclomiphene, you might be able to get away with anavar because enclomiphene improves lipid parameters that anavar would certainly worsen. Now, if you're not going to go with anavar because you know that it's skewing lipid parameters and your SHBG is going to crash to single digits, then don't touch the anavar and keep the enclomiphene dosages low. Because if you're otherwise drug-free and supplementing with a little bit of sublingual testosterone, I think that 6.25 milligrams enclomiphene per day is more than enough because you don't want your luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone to get into the super physiological range because then a guy like me with a lot of experience interpreting blood work results will say, hey, that LH and FSH is not meant to be 15 IUs <laughs> per milliliter, right? So keep this in mind. You uh, shouldn't overdo the enclomiphene just enough to sustain HPTA function or um, you know bring that up slightly, allowing your testosterone levels to come up. So you might have to do a lot of blood work in between before you finally publish your, your blood work results on YouTube or Instagram uh, claiming to be drug-free when you're certainly not um, because there might be a couple iterations where you're trying to find the ideal dosages of sublingual testosterone, aromacin, and clomiphene, and potentially even a low-dose Anavar on top. Now, again, with Anavar, you might be able to circumvent the lipid changes that Anavar potentiates by using enclomiphene alongside of it or the fish oil, such as bergamot, berberine, or cardarine, which all have a positive effect on your HDL levels. But the problem with Anavar is, like I mentioned before, it crushes your SHBG. Even at 2.5 to 5 milligrams Anavar daily, SHBG might come down slowly but steadily. I have a solution for that, so keep this in the back of your head. With enclomiphene, the problem is that it lowers IGF-1 levels, which again is not the end of the world because you can always claim natural if your IGF-1 levels, instead of, let's say, 150 nanograms per milliliter ends up at 100 nanograms per milliliter. Or you can always claim that you use metformin during the last cheat meal, which also reduces your IGF-1 levels quite significantly, probably more than a low-dose enclomiphene does. So besides the reduction in IGF-1, which you can circumvent with a couple more lies, I mean, we're lying through your teeth already. What's a couple more lies on top of that? Uh, the problem with enclomiphene is that it also raises your liver enzymes. Now, again, you can also say that you're just training insane and thus your ALT and ASD liver enzymes are not actually stemming from your liver, but they're stemming from skeletal muscle, right? If you know how to explain yourself well, you might be able to, um, you know, forego these particular blood work markers, which will be skewed. And of course, you can make it those Tutka, let's say 250 milligrams, 500 milligrams, 1000 milligrams Tutka per day to bring your liver enzymes back down. And regarding the IGF-1, well, a very simple solution for that with no tangible negative effects on your blood work parameters, exogenous growth hormone. <laughs> it's that simple. And in this protocol, you can actually megadose growth hormone and megadose IGF-1 to have a very cosmetically appearing physique, not have all these micro veins and crazy vascularity you would otherwise get from the selective androgen receptor modulators or the anabolic androgenic steroids, which are known to increase your blood pressure, duh. You're, you won't have this crazy, shredded, dry, hardcore, dense look, but the volume and the overall size and the muscularity certainly gets a lot more pronounced if you go on four to 12 IUs exogenous growth hormone per day. And the good thing about exogenous growth hormone or exogenous IGF-1, LR3, DES, or real Incorlex 
is that it metabolizes very, very quickly, right? Within the next couple of hours of a growth hormone administration, your serum growth hormone levels are right back down to baseline, might be even lower due to the uh, negative feedback loop that occurs within the pituitary gland because serum IGF-1 levels stay elevated to 4, 36 hours following a growth hormone administration. So all you need is two days off the exogenous growth hormone and off the exogenous IGF-1 for serum growth hormone and serum IGF-1 levels and serum IGF-1 binding protein 3 levels to fall back down to baseline, allowing you to claim natural. And I honestly think that the difference between exceptionally good genetics and average genetics is elevated IGF-1 levels. And I've seen blood work over the last couple of years so many times of guys who have pretty good genetics. They train natural for many years in duration. They follow the lifestyle. They walk the walk and talk the talk, but they haven't touched any performance enhancing drugs yet. And then you interpret their blood work results for their first cycle, right? Testosterone might be mediocre, let's say 500 to 800 nanograms per deciliter, nothing crazy. But then their IGF-1 levels, dude, 400, 600, maybe even higher, right? 400 to 600 nanograms per milliliter, which is super physiological. But they're natural. They're not taking any growth hormone secretagogues. They are just uh, have better IGF-1 production in the liver than everybody else. And they're full, they're round, they have a good amount of muscles on them, and they're perpetually lean even during the off-season. It sucks, but we have these genetic outliers out there. So in this protocol, a very large part of it is bring your IGF-1 levels as high as you can. The problem is, especially if you start megadosing the growth hormone with multiple 2 IU administrations over the day, is that might that you might cause insulin resistance, right? By increasing free-form fatty acids in the bloodstream. Now, luckily on blood work parameters, there's no marker for free fatty acids unless somebody specifically asks for it. I rarely see this on a blood work analysis uh, anywhere. I see serum triglycerides, but not free-form fatty acids. So you would not really be able to detect that unless you check your fasting insulin levels, which is easily detectable in most blood work planches, and hemoglobin A1c. So again, if I see that uh, you claim natural and your fasting insulin levels are sky high and your hemoglobin A1c is like uh, uh, twice as high as where it should be, like let's say 6%, then I already know that something is going wrong. Now again, you can use either cardarine to offset that or inject your full dose of growth hormone before bed in a somewhat fasted state and then take your IGF-1 upon waking, which has a positive effect on insulin sensitivity. And of course, you know, doing a little bit of cardio and eating a little bit cleaner, that will all help to keep your hemoglobin A1c and your fasting insulin levels under control. And if you want, you can even add insulin to this entire stack. But the problem with insulin is that even though you might get a good amount of fullness, the fullness might not be as good as the fullness you would get from a, a hefty dose of IGF-1. But for this fullness, you also potentiate a good amount of water retention. So I would rather have you look into a combination of growth hormone and IGF-1 instead of uh, keeping your protocol cheap and resulting to insulin, right? Even though blood work parameters might be better on insulin, I feel that you can mitigate all the negative changes that might come along with exogenous growth hormone and IGF-1 at higher dosages with over-the-counter supplements and the healthy practices. Now, the only real problem here that I see the recurring theme of this video is that growth hormone, IGF-1, and insulin all have a suppressive effect on sex hormone binding globulin. Now, if you take sublingual testosterone at moderate dosages, SHBG doesn't really come down much. If you take enclomiphene, SHBG might actually go up. If you forgo the anivar, your SHBG will not be negatively affected, but growth hormone IGF-1 and insulin will certainly bring that down. So you might have to look into thyroid medications, which are known to increase your SHBG alongside the enclomiphene that has its potential place as part of this stack. And again, we have to keep the thyroid medication as low as possible for it to raise SHBG levels favorably to offset the sublingual testosterone and potentially growth hormone IGF-1 insulin and maybe even Anivar. Um, because, of course, if you start supplementing with T4 and T3, your thyroid stimulating hormone also comes down and you can't ever have those bottomed out. It's a sure red flag for interpreters like myself. So I would only look into a replacement dose of exogenous T3 and T4 to keep your SHBG levels somewhat favorable. So I'm talking about dosages of 6.25 micrograms up to 12.5 micrograms T3 and 25 micrograms up to 50 micrograms T4, maybe once or twice per day, or um, splitting that up into multiple dosages. So the influx of exogenous T3 and T4 is not very, very high. So it has an immediate 
blunting effect on your thyroid stimulating hormone. A very low dose goes a very long way because the other compounds are at hopefully at a very low dose as well. And a higher dose of T3 is known to reduce your HDL levels, right? And we're already trying to fight absolutely with every measure we can to keep HDL levels somewhat favorable, right? Everything overlaps, so keep it all in mind. And you can always use terkesterone or ecticerone at 50 milligrams each, let's say three times per day. So that's 100 milligrams turk and ecti combined over three servings over the day to potentiate collagen synthesis through the estrogen receptors. From all the blood work that I've seen, terkesterone and ecticerone have no negative effect on blood work parameters and they don't downregulate the HBTA, don't have a negative effect on lipid parameters, and they might even be able to raise SHBG levels alongside a thyroid medication. So all you get is increased anabolism and a slight a boosting effect on your SHBG. Now, if you go with the full Monty route of five milligrams sublingual testosterone in clomiphene and let's say five milligrams oxandrolone, and that brings your SHBG down, um, and potentiates also a good amount of animalism. You might be able to bring your SHBG up with thyroid medications, trochesterone and ectisterone, but I highly doubt that it will potentiate additional animalism alongside the sublingual testosterone and VAR that you're already taking, because that's 10 milligrams of anabolic androgenic steroids per day combined. And how much is 300 milligrams of trochesterone and ectisterone per day combined going to add uh, on top of that. Oh, and before you start complaining about the 300 milligrams tergesterone and ectisterone, keep in mind that Gorilla Mind has a complex formula for tergesterone and ectisterone, and every 500 milligram capsule contains a 10% extract of either 50 milligrams tergesterone or 50 milligrams ectisterone. So if you take, let's say, three capsules of each, you get 150 milligrams net. All right? Please read the back of the bottle, so you know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. And then there's clenbuterol at 20 micrograms, let's say up to four times daily, albeit that I feel that the lower dose of 20 micrograms once per day upon waking is more than sufficient to help with anabolism or to offset anti-catabolic effects. Um, if you restrict your calories to look good on social media because you're a dirty, fake, natty influencer and you need to be shredded 24 seven, 20 micrograms clenbuterol has no negative effect on your blood work parameters, but might be able to improve your skin texture, make you look more cosmetically appealing, improve fat loss. Obviously, it's a fat burner after all, duh. And it, since it improves central nervous system stimulation, the contractile capacity and the workout performance that you might get out of a low dose of clenbuterol with a very long half-life. I mean, I think the half-life is like 36 hours, so you would need to dose it once per day upon waking more than enough. You get improved performance in the gym, which results ultimately in a little bit of increased muscularity. And if you use it as a fat loss aid and you control your calories uh, alongside cardarine and maybe growth hormone, um, then you should look a lot better than you do without it. And since we're now doing all these fat loss aids, we might as well go with injectable carnitine alongside the rest of this performance enhancing drug stack to potentiate additional fat loss when we're taking cardarine, clenbuterol and growth hormone and IGF-1 to a certain extent. I mean, it might as well, right? And injectable carnitine is known to lower serum triglyceride levels. Um, that's the only real positive effect on uh, blood work parameters. And again, if you're dosing growth hormone at higher dosages or multiple times per day, then serum triglyceride levels, but free form fatty acids will certainly go up and we use injectable carnitine to offset that. And besides all of these, there are also a boatload of metabolic modulators and fat burners you can choose from, which have no real tangible negative effects on your blood work parameters if any, so no additional management needs to be put in place. But as the name implies, they also offer very little when it comes to anabolism or to enhance your cosmetic appearance. So let's leave all of those off the table for now. All right, I hope it was insightful. Here's the entire protocol on the screen right now so you can do additional research. Again, we didn't go over all the potential long-term negative health ramifications of all the compounds which we just discussed, right? We just highlighted uh, potential blood work changes but that's not the full story. So if you're going to go with a protocol like this, do some fucking research, please. Right? It's not only about how you can manage the Lightroom and the you know uh, color grading so you can look phenomenal on Instagram. While you take these performance enhancing drugs, you also have to make sure that you understand the potential long-term negative health ramifications of these drugs and how that might be exacerbated with other stuff that you're doing. And if you're going to go with a protocol like this, Send me your before and after pictures and your after blood work results, which again, all your blood work parameters should still stay in range, but you should look 
significantly better. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. The ultimate fake natty influencer front double bicep for you guys. But let's be honest, I took a load of steroids back in the day. And even though I'm relying on ATG monotherapy, I mean, all those myonuclei and increased anabolism that I had for over a decade, <laughs> that's not going away anywhere. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.